will be on two kinds of immigrants and migrations that I've studied. I'm going to speak about the Ugandan issue, re-expatriates in Switzerland, and uh, also the Indian South Africans. But I would like to start with the experience of the Ugandan nations in Switzerland. As we know, that in 1971, Idi Amin had issued a call for the expulsion of the Ugandan nations. Uh, and um, many, many people, or let's say it's a little known fact that some of the Ugandan nations also went to Switzerland. And when I went to do my research in South Africa, when I talked to them that there are Ugandan nations in Switzerland, nobody believed me. That's the time when they asked me, well, if there are, why don't you write a paper on them? Do field work, and that's how the background of this paper arose. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of challenges because uh, nobody has ever done field work on the Uganda nations in Switzerland. And the Uganda nations are scattered in all the cantons because this is how the Swiss integration happened. They are in uh, Lucerne, they are in Bern, they are in Thun, they are in Geneva, so in the French, the Italian, and the German parts of Switzerland, they were scattered. So to do research amongst them was a very expensive business. I had to travel all over Switzerland and uh, yes, and also ask for special permission from the, uh, because the information on Uganda nations was strictly guarded in Swiss archives. But anyway, it was an exciting journey and it challenged me as a researcher very much uh, because I had already been in Switzerland for five years and I've been presenting at various functions of the Indians, people recognized me. Hence, I was able to get good interviews. And I present you my research uh, from, uh, well, those interviews. So, um, I want to look at the Ugandan Asian expulsion from Uganda and entering to Switzerland and be as beyond an ethnic, political, and spatial event. In the sense that, you know, um, they were not just twice migrants. Although a lot of people have spoken about twice migrants, but the Uganda nations were not twice migrants alone. They were in reality re-expatriates. If you look at the concept of twice migrants, it's easy to define. First, they migrated from Uganda to, uh, from India to Uganda, and then when Idi Amin uh, issued the expulsion order, they were taken by many countries, including Switzerland. So this was, of course, a political and a spatial event in an ethnic gaze, the gaze of an outsider. But when I went to interview the Ugandan Asians in Switzerland, they said that we are not just twice migrants, we are re-expatriates. We had to rework the experience that our ancestors had done. So we had to remove, we had to resettle, and we had to readapt and reenact the role that our ancestors had performed and accomplished long back. So this was one thing which, uh, which was very um, important in the self-identity of the Uganda nations in Switzerland. And I think that this integration of the Uganda nations in Switzerland is very important to study because it has been very peaceful, very successful, and the Uganda nations are now integrated as Swiss citizens and um, it is worth emulation. More so now that we're having a problem of migrants all over the world, it really is a migration and an integration worth studying. They were first generation in Uganda or second generation? Uh, they were first generation in Uganda. They became old. And then they came to Switzerland with little children. And now the children in Switzerland are grown up. So I work with both the generations, the first as well as the second generations. So um, in Switzerland, they were taken in as contingent refugees. Uh, so what impressed me is that, you know, that one needs to bridge the gap between the anthropology of the state and the anthropology of the people. So we have to juxtapose the integration as I researched on paper by the Swiss government and compare them with the actual experiences of volunteers from humanitarian organizations such as the Red Cross. So I did a lot of work with the Red Cross and um, 
I wanted to ask this uh, question to the Red Cross people who worked and some of them who were alive because uh, the Uganda nations were received by Switzerland in 1971. I was lucky to find two people still alive from Red Cross. So I worked with them and I worked with the refugees who are now Swiss citizens. And um, I asked them what kind of identity do you carry? And uh, they were more connected, more than being connected to Uganda, the second generation uh, Asian, Uganda nations in Switzerland were attracted to the idea of India. And when I asked the young Uganda nations in Switzerland why, because Uganda is the place from where you came, so why do you think of India? And they said because our parents have had bad experience in Uganda, they were expelled, the first generation Uganda nations. So we've grown up seeing our parents missing the nine, crying, looking at the beauty of the Swiss and crying over Uganda. You know, they could not forget Uganda. So we prefer not to look at Uganda as our, as, as our you know, host country homeland, but we want to look back at India. So this is interesting for foreign policy, how the second generation Uganda nations in Switzerland uh, look at India as their ancestral homeland with a renewed sense of love. So um, uh, I uh, looked at families settled in German as well as French parts of Switzerland. There are a mix of Hindu and Muslim families, uh, from Koja Muslims, Islami, Ismaili Muslims, and Gujarati Hindus. So they come from parts and belts which are now spread between Pakistan, India, and Afghanistan. And that is why I call them Uganda nations. Although a uh, majority of them pertain to what was the Indian subcontinent before the partition. So, um, uh, of course, the data was collected through various kinds of sources, uh, through personal objects which were preserved by the family, such as wedding albums, documents, passports issued by Ugandan government, and passports, temporary passports given to them at the airport by the Swiss government to receive them so that they do not remain without document. And that was one essential part to immediately make them politically integrated within the Swiss system. So, um, the thing, the question to ask is how did this integration succeed from below? We know that it succeeded from above because of the meticulous precision with which the Swiss government received and envisaged the migration. They wanted to disperse them in all parts of Switzerland. They did not want to have Ugandan Indians concentrated in one part so that they become ghettoized. But they sent 20, 20, 20 in various cities and cantons so that they are forced or let's say they're encouraged to talk to the local people. And the local people were trained to receive the migrants. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the most uh, beautiful part of the history of Swiss migration here. And the way they welcomed the contingent refugees from um, Uganda. So however, during the interviews that I had, uh, it was important to note that Looking at it from a top, or a, uh, let's say with a helicopter vision is incomplete view. We have to look at it from the point of view of how people integrate themselves when they are forced to become migrants or refugees, diasporas. And um, so um, that is one question that I explored. Um, but just to take you back a little bit to the history, when they were expelled, from Uganda, there was an Indophobic climate in Uganda, and at the same time, there was a movement towards Africanization in Uganda, and simultaneously, Idi Amin was rising to power, and he uh, he embellished his call to power by the call for de-Indianization, because this made the hysteria complete, and Idi Amin emerged as the leader who wanted to rid Africa, Uganda, of the Asians, and. When he issued the call that within 60 days, if the Asians do not evacuate or are not evacuated out of Uganda, they will all be killed. It was taken very seriously by the international community. And Swiss government, Switzerland as a state, was the first to recognize that there was a humanitarian crisis. And this political trauma was solved um, in 1972 when 200 Ugandans were taken in by the, Swiss, by, by the Swiss state as stateless refugees. 
So under the United Nations Commission for uh, Refugees, uh, they were called the Contingent Refugees. And um, I was able to interview the officer who went from Switzerland to Uganda and brought them in a chartered plane. So there were two chartered planes which came from Switzerland to Uganda. We are having 100 Ugandan nations each. And Tripunais, who was the administrative official who stacked the Ugandan passports over there to bring them into Switzerland, is fortunately still alive and serving. And I was able to interview him. And he, per he, um, he says, Switzerland was the first country to respond to the international call issued by the International Commission of Migration to accommodate fleeing Ugandan nations. So uh, this, of course, uh, the Swiss plan had a two-tier, they had a, a sort of a two-tier plan for accommodating the Ugandan nation. In the first instance, it was a centralized, in phase one, it was a centralized action where the Ugandan nations would be received in Switzerland by national state apparatus. But once the canton was decided to which canton, which families will go, then the integration would be completely local and this would be the phase two. And as soon as they arrived at the Clotenau airport on the 1st of November in 1972, there was volunteers from Swiss Red Cross waiting and they coordinated uh, with general charity and assistance and also provided one volunteer per family. So this is one notable thing that how one volunteer who knew German, who knew English, was provided to each family of the Ugandan nations and then this family relied on this volunteer from Red Cross to ask them for clothes, where to buy food and where to get charity and this helped in this integration in, in this less studied integration which I think holds many lessons for all of us. So uh, one of the best approach, one of, one of the political doctrine which held success in this particular experience was that Swiss government encouraged the Uganda nations to integrate first and citizenship later. So there was a bait for those Uganda nations who were taken in by Switzerland that they were offered language courses, they were offered various kinds of jobs, their children were offered school admissions, all pointing to the fact that once you're able to make your way through Switzerland and adapt to Switzerland, your passports as Swiss citizens will come later. And this is what exactly happened. The Uganda nations were interviewed, they went through written exams for citizenship, they were interviewed by their respective cantons, and they were issued Swiss visas. And one of the most, um, uh, most cherished role which the Uganda nations themselves remember is the way for the first three months the Swiss Red Cross volunteers worked with them in their shelter homes and many Uganda nations in Switzerland told me how people from good families, women from good families um, would come to their homes, to their shelter homes cook and clean for them, bring clothes. So this is one thing which they still remember very fondly and uh, they said that they were assisted not only in finding homes, schools and jobs, clothes and furniture, but also the right hospitals and doctors for their particular ailments or their medical necessities. And this lesson is great in humanitarian accommodation of um, uh, refugees. And as of now, um, I will tell you the statement, uh, uh, 40 years after the expulsion, the first time in um, Switzerland, a United Asian Association has been formed, and um, a second generation Ugandan Asian uh, gave a speech on that occasion of the first meeting of this organization. They say, much has changed in the 40 years since our arrival. We all have made our personal experiences and we've been through difficult times, especially during the first few years as we were desperate to learn either German or French or Italian in order, in order to exchange views with the local community. Our emphasis and priority was put in the education of our children so that the new generation could adequately integrate and perform their professional duties and aim for higher academic degrees and careers. For many of us, Switzerland has been a success story. Switzerland being our new home has enabled us to establish our individual roots. 
We would like to thank the Swiss federal government and all our Swiss friends who assisted us in settling down in this beautiful and prosperous Confederación Helvetica, which is the official name of Switzerland. I still admire the voluntary work performed by so many Swiss men and women who were determined to settle us in our new domicile. Before ending my speech, I would like you to join me for thanking the organizers who have put in lots of hard work in time to mark the 40th anniversary of our arrival from Uganda, a very special moment for many of us. So, as far as the Swiss integration is concerned, and as far as the status of the migrants is concerned, they're happy. They have not had bad experiences, except the hard work that they had to replicate of their ancestors. So they became twice, more than twice migrants. They considered themselves as re-expatriate. But at the same time, what is important to note is that when you travel or when you do field work amongst the re-expatriates, you do not find a vanquished diaspora. You find a victorious diaspora. Because most of the time, when I went to interview, I had a prejudice. I used to think that this diaspora is going to be suffering. They're going to be sad that they were twice migrants. They were expelled under bad circumstances. But no, they are just a very happy and resilient uh, diaspora, which when we talk about Indian South Africans, well, the same fact comes through. So they're well settled and well integrated professionals. They have inter-community contacts and, uh, during events and religious festivals, not as much as in casual life because they're scattered, but they have no communal feelings. If, because they're Hindus as well as Muslims, so if anything goes wrong between the Hindus and Muslims in India or Pakistan, the Uganda nation diaspora, which has Hindus as well as Muslims, has no bad feeling or communal feeling towards each other. They're organized now, they have an organization, and at the same time, they inhabit a world of double consciousness, where the first generation looks more towards Uganda. This is very interesting. The first generation, which is old now, and some of them are dead, they look more towards Uganda as their host country, as their homeland. Whereas the second generation, who were either very small when this migration happened, or grew up, or were born in Switzerland, they look more towards India. So this is uh, quite an interesting finding for diaspora studies. And here, I think I would like to show you some of the photographs, um, some of the photographs which I was able to get from the Red Cross. Yeah, these are the photographs. So this is the arrival at the airport, and as you can see, the Red Cross volunteer welcoming the families right at the airport. This is Zurich. Yes, we can see the African. <laughs> we can see the, we can see the African, you know, the African attires over there. Yes. You know, well, the they colors. Wait for me. <laughs> Just, uh, yes. So they came with their dolls. It was a sudden expulsion. Look at the way the children are coming. And um, yes. <laughs> so uh, most of them were also presented with Swiss. If you can see this, yes, they were presented by the Swiss humanitarian staff to make them feel happy already at their arrival. And, uh, well, this shows how uh, an old woman is being assisted uh, to make uh, the welcome complete. And here we see how a Red Cross volunteer is trying to fit this young man, this young boy, into a warmer pair of jeans because November 1 is cold in Switzerland. In Uganda, it wasn't cold. So immediately they thought of all those things. And again, they are measuring yet another person who's grown up now, adolescent. Uh, and look at the boxes in the background. So this was really uh, well thought of integration and welcome. And here you have a family. Uh, well, this was a mixed family: Ugandan, Asian, of Indian, Indian Asian descent, married to a mixed and African. But still, when they are expelled, they all migrate with their three children and they come into Switzerland. And well, these are the houses, the shelter homes, where they are taught how to buy, what kind of food to cook, because cheese, suddenly they have to adapt themselves to cheese. From Ugandan Asian spicy food to Swiss cheese, <laughs> which is most easily available. So that, those were the little humanitarian touches in learning each other. So, 
with this, my um, presentation on the United Nations is complete, and we go on to the Indian South African. Uh, no, sorry. Let's see. The Indian South African experience. I have presented this PowerPoint um, in a conference on diaspora in India, and this paper is already published. Uh, as a part of a journal by Taylor and Francis, the publication of Taylor and Francis. Again, here, one of the most uh, important objective of my study was what is the difference between the amic and the ethnic conceptions of diaspora, or how do a diaspora view itself amically in contrast to that as it is viewed ethically by the state or by those who are the policy makers of the diaspora policies. And I wanted to see what is the difference, and are we missing something, or is there a gap? So, um, as we know, the Indian South African diaspora is very different from the United Nations experience. The Indian South Africans migrated, uh, migrated to South Africa around 1860. Um, uh, 1860, were during the time of indentured labor. So uh, this also speaks of the shared history of colonialism, migration, indenture, and trade that India and South Africa share with each other. And when India got independence in 1947, the Prime Minister of India, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, decided to have um, an active engagement with the principle of non-alignment, and therefore. They pulled relations, pulled back from having active relations from the South African diaspora. And at the same time, those were the years in 1940, between 1948 to 1994 when apartheid was at its height. So the South African diaspora, although it had only one movement from India to South Africa, yet the fact is that it was a traumatic movement because the home country or the ancestral homeland stopped complete relationships with them during the apartheid government. And therefore, the South African diaspora had to evolve a lot. Uh, it cherishes its Indianness, but there are visible limits because they locate themselves, again, just as the Swiss Indian diaspora is settled, but with a certain closeness to being Swiss, to being proud Swiss citizens, Similarly, the Indian South Africans in South Africa have an engagement with Indianness, but at the same time, they, this is a very African Indianness. When I work with them in South Africa, this is what I came to know, that we love being Indian, we love our culture, we love the dresses, we love the music, we love the dances, but then it stops. We are South Africans before we are Indians. So this identity is important for foreign policy makers and uh, international experts to when they formulate um, uh, when they formulate conceptions or trade or in the globalized world newer relations. So uh, let's see how the Indian officials describe the diaspora of South Africa. Well, uh, they have uh, categories such as OCI, which is Overseas Citizens of India, or BIO, which is People of Indian Origin, and now more recently with neoliberalization, we have NRI which is non-resident Indian. So there are high profile conceptions and ceremonies being run by the Indian government. And in fact, uh, Shashi Tharoor, who was the Indian Minister of State for Human Resource Development, ha is, known to have said, NR, uh, is known to have said that um, uh, no other country has anything like it, an annual jamboree of its diaspora, conducted with great fanfare by its government. India has been doing it. He refers to the Pravasi Bharat, Bharatiya Divas, Divas, or the um, day dedicated to the non-resident Indians or the people of Indian origin. So he says that India is one of the first countries to end such, such a day. And it has been doing it with great success for a decade. Time to recall the return to, the return to India of the most famous Indian expatriate of them all, Mahatma Gandhi who alighted from his South African ship in Bombay on January 9, 1915. So January 9 is known as the NRI Day in India. 
As I write, the southern port city of Kochi is overflowing with expatriate Indians celebrating their connection to their India, which is the only country that has an official acronym for its expatriates, NRIs, or non-resident Indians. In my book, India, From Midnight to the Millennium, I suggested, only half-jokingly, that the question is whether NRI should stand for not really Indian or never relinquished India. So this is like an engagement which the state has with diaspora. Sometimes they think that, well, the diaspora is not really Indian, but at other times now when the debates on neoliberalization are catching uh, and mixing with globalization, suddenly India has discovered its diaspora and it says, well, those people never relinquished India. So it's a newfound interest in the diaspora. And um, interestingly, our Prime Minister, the then Prime Minister Manmohan Singh talked of the diaspora as united around the idea of Indianness. But I would like to question this, that even if the diaspora of India and South Africa is a source of pride and support and investment, is that a better description? How does one relate this to the Indian South Africans? I think one has to be very conscious, very cautious, um, uh, instead of excitedly defining um, the Indian diaspora in South Africa with a state vision alone. And therefore, I worked with the Indian South Africans to find out their, their own perspectives about themselves. And um, I choose to work with social movements, two kinds of movements which depicted two kinds of platforms of the Indian South Africans. One was a community self-help movement which goes back to 1912 when an organization which has roots in the Arya Samaj in India formed in 1875 was asked to go to South Africa because the South African Indians were beginning to forget how to celebrate their own festivals. Uh, like one of the main festivals is Diwali and because there was no relationship between the indentured laborers in South Africa and in India there was a complete communication gap. And many of the migrants were suffering because their own children were forgetting the traditions. And hence, this organization was called and they established a youth organization called the Arya Yuvak Sangh in 1912, which blossomed into a beautiful organization called the Aryan Benevolent Home, which has a very tragic, but at the same time, a history full of love. In 1918, there was an Indian man who was the first generation of indentured labor. He was very old and he was sick. He could no longer labor on the farm and the owners had kicked him out. At that time, there were old age homes only for the Europeans. And the black South Africans had their own family system and networks. And the Indian migrants or the migrant indentured labor had no support system. There were no hospitals. There wasn't any political provision for having the first generation uh, indentured labor becoming old to put them in, let's say, like here they say geriatric or <laughs> geriatric care. So at that time, this youth organization became the Aryan Benevolent Home and it took in to care these immigrants who were getting old and who were thought of as uh, no longer as assets and who were thought as they can be discarded easily and they were on roadsides. So one old man was discovered inside a South African uh, toilet in Durban. And a policeman, a white police, was beating him up and said that you cannot spend the night here. At that time, the Indian South Africans, for the first time united in a community self-help movement and made their own uh, nursing care uh, and, and schools, and they are still going strong even now as we speak. It's called the Aryan Benevolent Home. So the Indian South African diaspora knew how to reinvent its role as, as a movement, you know, not only as indentured labor, not only emphasizing their Indianness, but also coming into being as a community to do a banal function as looking after its own old if the state was racist. This movement is pre-apartheid. And now when I went to South Africa, there was a, a beautiful movement uh, known by heritage, uh, uh, fired by the enthusiasm of heritage and commemoration. This is already post-South, uh, post-apartheid South Africa, the new South Africa, the Rainbow Nation, in which suddenly the Indian communities uh, think of the politics of sight, meaning thereby that the Indian South Africans 
um, the Indians of Africans have a different engagement. They not only look at their ancestral homeland, which is India, with fond memories, but they have their own memory systems. So, uh, for example, the Phoenix settlement is very important in the memory system of the Indian South Africans. It is in this settlement that Mahatma Gandhi, for the very first time, established a press against racism, established a press, uh, established the doctrine of Satyagraha, and also civil disobedience and non-cooperation. So, in reality, the ideas that he brought back from South Africa it helped us to fight our own freedom struggle. But they were evolved in the Phoenix settlement, which is a farm, which now the family of Mahatma Gandhi has donated to the South African government, where slum dwellers or those people who do not have home and are belong to a mixed race, they live over there. So they also have a legacy foundation called the 1860 Legacy Foundation. The 1860 is the first year when the indentured labor from India into South Africa and then the struggle is a struggle not only as Indian for their Indianness but also as an African because they wanted to free South Africa of apartheid just as the native Africans wanted to do that. And I participated, I was lucky enough that when I was traveling through South Africa, I participated in the centenary celebrations of the first Satyagraha movement which happened not in India but in South Africa in 1930 under the auspices of Mahatma Gandhi and his followers and it was jointly organized by the Aryan Benevolent Home. This is the home which I was talking about which became an old age home. So a pre-apartheid community self-help movement amongst the Indian South African also functions now to support the commemoration ceremonies and heritage politics which is taking place uh, between India and South Africa which is taking place now uh, amongst the Indian South Africans. So I would like to show you some photographs which are interesting um, at this juncture. Here. So this is uh, the House of India in Durban and in black is the Council General of India uh, standing next to his wife and the officer uh, in white is the officer next in command. So this is an occasion when they were celebrating the Republic Day of India and it's celebrated with great fanfare. In fact, India now shows reverse pride. There was a moment when the Indian diaspora showed pride for its ancestral homeland. But now, as the diaspora is sustainable, it's successful, it's, it has shown integrity, it has struggled for anti-apartheid politics and a pro-democracy movement, Indian government shows also a sense of reverse pride in its South African Indian diaspora, which is actually a good term in international relations. And here, uh, this is uh, once again the celebration of the 26th of January, formal celebration in the evening. The first picture was in the morning when we do the flag hosting. This is the evening ceremony and the lady that you see in the beige sari with the black band is Ila Gandhi. She is the granddaughter of Mahatma Gandhi because one part of his family stayed back. One of his sons stayed back in South Africa and she is the daughter of one of his sons. And um, so very closely connected to India and the Indian embassy is also proud always to come with a presence in their functions. Now this is the site. This is Glencoe in Dandi in South Africa. This is the site where Mahatma Gandhi started his first Satyagraha in 1930 and along with his wife they crossed over two bordering states in the spirit of non-cooperation and civil disobedience. So we were all, I was fortunate enough to be there during my field work days and we covered this site uh, to attend the commemoration ceremony of the, the hundred year of the first Indian Satyagraha which is not in India but in South Africa. So we have people from all races, all backgrounds. We have Indian settled. This is the Indian diaspora that you see in background. Indians settled there since. These are like the third and the fourth generation of Indians that you see in the background. And this is once again the Council General um, saying something in the honor of the memory of Mahatma Gandhi and his Satyagraha movement and the importance of Glencoe and Dandi as well as the contribution of the Indian South Africans in South Africa. 
These two people belong to the Aryan Benevolent Home. They organized a charity music show in Dandi to honor the contribution of Mahatma Gandhi and the origin of the first Satyagraha in 1913. So we see how the Indian South Africans are a, a commendable diaspora. They've sustained their needs and they have uh, participated in the nation building as well. However, the two diasporic experiences are a bit different and I would like to sum up my presentation by reading to you the parts of my text uh, which, which is actually uh, how I would like to bring out the paper to look at diasporas in movement, immigrants from India and South Africa and Switzerland. So I start by analyzing diasporas as communities in movement, patterns, origins, evolutions. We focus on the Indian origin migrants in South Africa and Uganda nations, Indians in Switzerland. My main epistemological concern and related research curiosity and the basic question is can diasporas be akin to communities in absolute terms? Do community relationships emerge or submerge, attract or repel through diasporic consciousness, or vice versa? Indian origin diasporas may refer to and signify a mixed group of Indian origin as well as Indians based abroad, owing to the peculiar history of the subcontinent in which the pre-British subcontinent had open frontiers where mixed ethnic belts with overlapping cultures, customs, and different religions and ethnicity resided in close proximity to each other, spatially and socially. So all diasporas from regions that are now separated, for instance, Pakistan and India are separated, Bangladesh is separated, but during the time that the old diasporic migration happened, this region was all one, as India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. They still may come to be recognized as Indians or Indian origin communities abroad. In general, every diaspora, in my view, contributes to the enriching of the concept of diaspora as well as providing a window for extending it further. The reality of diverse itinerant diasporas amidst huge social, economic, and political processes such as wars, evolution of basic rights, or engagement with discrimination have always been taking place juxtaposed one to the other. Each diaspora is special in many local and international ways as it continues to challenge and enhance the notion of diaspora according to contemporarily evolving changes such as globalization, which have linked up as well as fragmented the world at the same time. Using the example of Indian immigrants, I will focus on how diasporas organize themselves as community associations, having a collective consciousness, such as in South Africa, or plainly embed themselves in their host countries with an individualized integration such as the Ugandan uh, Asian migrants in Switzerland. Let's talk of Indian South Africans and Ugandan um, uh, Indians in Switzerland to have a brief comparison of differences and similarities. Indian South Africans are more like a collective action-oriented community, but the Ugandan nations in Switzerland are a community that engages in collective memory rather than collective tasks both depict varying attachment to a common homeland. South African Indians were displaced once, while the Uganda nations were displaced twice from the home as well as the host country. However, both Indian <coughs> Asian diasporas, being well integrated in their country residence, show respect to the idea of ancestral, ancestral homeland only to a limited extent. For the sake of a more nuanced understanding, away from details of geographical origin, it does well to consider that the historical diaspora is different from the contemporary ones in many instances. I've written a paper separately on this topic where I say that the historical diaspora is the one which has a different attachment to the host country, whereas the contemporary diasporas are more moving and they might be moving in a very globalized context where they are looking for uh, having the best post, the best job, the maximum earning. So there is a slight difference between the historical diaspora of Indian South Africans, for example, and the one that comes into South Africa now from India. It comes to find jobs. And um, for instance, the ones that settled down during the time of indenture in South Africa and contributed in the anti apartheid struggle 
are very different from those who contemporarily migrated under post neoliberalization regimes, though they continue to have interactions with each other. Contemporary migrants are related to India more directly, while for old South Africans, Indianess is definable also in terms of distance of time elapsed between migration from homeland and time spent in the host country. Though at a given point of time in future, the differences may mitigate as the contemporary diaspora comes into and settles down in the fold of identities akin to the old diaspora, yet momentarily, as of now, on ground, differences between two remain clear and worth elaborating. Uganda nations in Switzerland, on the other hand, depict a different bond towards India, which remains the older homeland of the parents of the first generation migrants, refugees or those who became direct refugees in Switzerland. So the distant ancestral association with India got a renewed vigor once the diaspora were converted into refugees in 1971. Somehow their twice migrant experience res uh, resulted in more attention towards a hitherto dormant question that of fascination towards their ancestral homeland in contrast to their parental host country, which was Uganda. So my concluding observations, which talk of the experience of diaspora in a broader context of migration and refugees, um, I would like to see diaspora past and present as humanity on the move. This brings us to the issue of unpredictability of migrant socio-political experiences. Whilst settled and an old diaspora, such as that of Ugandan Indians, converted into a newly displaced refugee diaspora in Switzerland, the South African Indians faced a similar situation. Just when they were beginning to feel that their Herculean journey as a diasporic community became justified by their collective role in the fall of apartheid, along with fellow compatriots in their host country, their expectations of equal status have become subjected to various challenges. Now they face the reverse side of black economic empowerment, which has become confined in the quota system of the black Africans, leaving the Indians and other races and communities in a backseat. Hence, this aside from many other political meanings that it denotes, brings us back to the dynamic status as well as struggles of diaspora communities, which can undergo processes of settling down and experiencing dispersal of various categories, such as the internal challenges faced by the current Indian South Africans, the historical diaspora, or the external set of challenges to which the older generation of the Uganda nations were subjected upon being uprooted from their host country. So it is very difficult to predict the journey or the status of the diasporas anywhere in the world. So the problematic of diaspora trajectories therefore depends upon the various kinds of dispersals or displacements, social, political, economic, spatial, and geographic that they experience and the modalities in which they rise to accommodate themselves to newer challenges. This dynamic further enriches and defines the process of diasporic consciousness as operational, functional, or otherwise in communities. Recently, Karen Moore has argued that globalization as global capitalism is not an impenetrable borderless zone, but rather a set of constructed events based on a variety of promises, performances, and proclamations which can also become actual goals with precarious outcomes. Anthropologists are increasingly concerned with the question of how people around the world with these promises and pitfalls of capitalism and development agendas um, adjust. My paper focuses to add to this question the issue of migrants as refugees or diasporas and how they lead to defining new borders at the same time, demolishing or reinventing frontiers of human globalization whereby they traverse new opportunities while at the same time facing um, fundamental global and socio-political crises. In my view, therefore, from the ethical dimensions of economic life to the politics of immigration, the critical study of human well-being must become the center of concern that broaden our understanding of the human condition, especially of traveling diasporas, iterant migrants, forced or voluntary refugees who remain most affected by social media. Qualities. Towards this end, at a macro level, each nation, each nation that can live in leisure and give its citizens the goodness of globalization, in contrast to its insecurities, shares the onus of a humanitarian approach to understand migrant diasporas. 
at a micro level, each community that can live a safe and settled life owes a responsibility towards making diasporic communities at home. Given that diaspora, as my paper shows, moves in cycles of a stateless migrants to refugee migrants status or become diaspora with an evolved collective consciousness, in all probability, the humanitarian effort would be non-permanent and transitory. Given the right context and support system, diasporas have a knack of making themselves sustainable to the home as well as to the host countries. It certainly becomes well worth it to make globalization a more collective experience through the lens of diasporic communities from past and present. Mm -hmm.